Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to have you all here this evening for a fantastic satellite symposium. We'd like to thank our sponsors for this, but it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Camilleri, who is known to all of you, professor of medicine uh, at the Mayo Clinic and, and many other titles, which you are all familiar with. And I'm Dr. Satish Rao, professor of medicine from Augusta University in Augusta, Georgia. So we are here to chat about gastroparesis. So you can see the very conversational style in which we are sitting. And this is what we hope will be the theme of this meeting, where we will interact with you uh, in, in a positive manner and hope this interaction can lead to improved understanding of this very common condition that has had some significant strides in the recent past. And we'll, we'd like to share with you some of the recent knowledge. We will discuss, we will debate, and we encourage your active participation through the audience response systems that you will get to answer, as well as through these uh, pads. And please fire away any questions. I love questions on cricket, so you can also have that, uh, and, and, and so on. So with that brief introduction, Michael, any comments? Yeah, he likes cricket. I like soccer. <laughs> All right. So we have three main learning objectives for this session. Our objective number one is to review the signs and symptoms and diagnostic tests for diabetic gastroparesis. So let me begin by discussing a case, a patient I saw in my practice. And, and let's use this as a preamble for our understanding of gastroparesis. So this is a story of a 47-year-old female teacher. She came to see me with a three-year history of postprandial nausea, intermittent vomiting, fullness, early satiety, and epigastric pain. She lost about 15 pounds in weight over the past three years. And initially for these symptoms, she was prescribed uh, proton pump inhibitors as well as H2 blockers, and she had no response. Sounds familiar to most of you here. Subsequently, because of persistent symptoms, she underwent endoscopy, not once, not twice, but three times. And she also had helicobacter pylori testing, which was negative. And then, because of persistent symptoms, she had CAT scan, again, not once, but twice. And she also had an ultrasound scan, which were normal. Now, because of lack of relief of symptoms, with empiric treatments that were tried on her, and because of persistent pain and nausea, she had a HIDA scan. And guess what? Familiar, ejection fraction was 40%. And typically, what happens? They all get a cholecystectomy, and she had a cholecystectomy. No impact on her symptoms. Her symptoms persisted. And by the time she reached us, she had failed metoclopramide. Uh, she had uh, two PPIs. She was on um, uh, anti-nausea medications, prochlorperazine, as well as some hyoscyamine PRN. But again, with all of these, she had no relief. So what should we do? I guess you're all thinking, what is the differential diagnosis here, right? How about we engage you? And let's take this uh, audience response question. And I'd like you all to please uh, uh, key in and, and answer, uh, answer this. Interesting. Michael, what do you think of this response? Well, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, it's good that uh, we can dismiss a few of these diagnoses. Um, unexplained nausea and vomiting has uh, a few. Um, that's something we should still possibly consider. 
I agree with the, uh, the uh, uh, group that small intestinal pseudo obstruction is highly unlikely. She's had CT scans, there's no evidence of dilatation, um, there's no report of any sort of stasis in the small bowel or colons uh, on the CT scan. So I agree, you know, uh, item number four, small intestinal pseudo obstruction, highly unlikely. Biliary dyskinesia. Is, is really relatively rare. Uh, patient really didn't respond to cholecystectomy. That could still keep it in the differential diagnosis. So um, even though it, it's relatively uh, subscribed by a small number of people, um, that's something one could potentially consider. Um, not sure is probably a sensible one. <laughs> and we uh, will need to move into perhaps what the next steps might be. So the main, the main uh, uh, differential here, I think, is, um, as you have determined, functional dyspepsia or gastroparesis. Now, you know, the, the uh, definition of gastroparesis really implies impairment of gastric emptying in the absence of mechanical obstruction. And we know that the patient has had three EGDs, so there's no mechanical obstruction at the level of the uh, um, outlet from the stomach. So that certainly would be consistent but we don't really have any information on stomach emptying. Functional dyspepsia is another possibility, and of course, some of those patients do have impaired gastric emptying, but some people also have increased uh, gastric or duodenal hypersensitivity, or there may be an abnormality of gastric accommodation. And so I would agree with the, you know, the majority of the selections here. Um, unexplained nausea and vomiting is really a, a symptom-based diagnosis, but I think I would su submit to you that if we can do some further testing, we may be able to explain the nausea and vomiting. But at this stage, uh, in the absence of tests of, for instance, of motor function or of sensitivity, it's reasonable to keep that in the differential diagnosis. So Michael, I mean, are there any symptoms that are kind of specific for gastroparesis that you normally try and tease out from your patients? And also, uh, can you uh, tell us, are there any tools that can help us to better characterize the severity of symptoms of gastroparesis? So thanks, Satish. I, I think one of the um, most useful tools that has been developed over the last 20 years, but has been really perfected and uh, simplified over the last few years, um, and I see Henry Parkman in the audience, and he and, and Dennis Ravicki have worked hard at developing um, the Gastroparesis Cardinal Symptom Index Daily Diary. So this is being developed as a daily diary for use, for instance, in the context of clinical trials. But I find this to be quite a useful clinical tool. It's uh, through the work that was done by Henry and Dennis Ravicki, we know the predominant symptoms or the most relevant symptoms that are reported by patients are as listed, nausea, vomiting, postprandial fullness, early satiety, abdominal pain. And I think that the, uh, the symptoms themselves then lend themselves for assessment of severity. Originally, when this uh, instrument was developed, it was a bit more complex, but now it's based on a five-point scale. And um, I usually find that assessing those predominant symptoms is very useful to help me understand how severe is the patient's symptomatology, how, uh, and also to follow up the patient after my um, trials in, in the clinic. So I think that's, I mean, I tend to use the same way, Michael, like you. So I, uh, if at all possible, I try and document this at baseline. And as you rightly said, this is truly helpful when you know, we do an intervention and they come back, I mean, you can see, you know, sometimes symptoms can be, if you just ask the patient, they can be a little misleading, but when we really drill it down and say, well, can you tell us, you know, can you score your nausea, and then we compare it from what they've said before, that really makes a big difference in understanding whether these uh, interventions that you're trying are working or not. So I find that very, very useful. Just, just one proviso. Um, the weight loss there used to be one of the criteria in the original uh, gastroparesis cardinal symptom index. It's now bloating is, uh, should be replacing the term weight loss there. So let me tell you, Michael, what we found uh, in this uh, school teacher when we applied the GCSI here. So she had scored a nausea of four, vomiting of three, postprandial fullness of three, early satiety at three, pain at three, and bloating at four. So she had significant symptoms, and overall, 
she scored 20 out of 24. So what do you make of this and, and how would you interpret this? So again, reminding ourselves, the scale is zero to four. Four is the highest, the most severe symptomatology that we have in this patient. And clearly, um, she must have been asking her, her doctors who saw her before you to really try to find out the cause of these very severe symptoms. So to my mind, this is really at that sort of highest level of severity. And it would um, encourage me clinically to try and find out, you know, a little bit more about what might be the cause of the problem um, so that I can be a little bit more specific and try to individualize how I would be treating the patient. So we should be probably thinking perhaps of some kind of testing at this stage, you think, right? Absolutely. All right. So let's see if we can engage our, our audience one more time here. So uh, what would be your next step in the evaluation of this patient? So we've listed a number of tests. Would you order a gastric emptying test, a scintigraphy of two hours, a gastric emptying scintigraphy test of four hours, a wireless motility capsule test? Would you order a spirulina or octanoic acid breath test, a water load test or a nutrient drink test, gastric spec scan, or you're unsure which one you want to order. So let's have the 10-second uh, timer up and let's get the response, please. Oh, wow, Michael. So what do you think now? I, I like what I see. <laughs> um, so let's go through these a little bit. Um, I, I think there's a lot of places around the country still do a gastric emptying test that only lasts two hours. And I think the, the data from several groups, including our friends in, at Temple and the work we've done at Mayo, would suggest that an optimal gastric emptying test should include the emptying of solids and should be appraised for at least three hours and possibly for four hours. So I agree with the 77% who opted for the four-hour gastric emptying test. The two-hour gastric emptying test could be useful if there is uh, less than 25% of the radio-labeled meal emptied from the stomach on, on our test uh, at Mayo, or if there is uh, less than 40% emptied from the stomach on the egg beaters meal, the two-hour uh, assessment could be very useful as well. But ideally, uh, keeping in mind that just because the patient gets another scan at four hours, you're not increasing the radio, radio, radio uh, isotopic expo radiation exposure. So there's no increased risk. And remember as well that, because um, this, this question actually came up today, when we do these gastric emptying tests, the patient isn't sitting inside a camera for four hours. They're only in front of a camera standing up taking a frontal picture and a back picture for about five minutes altogether. So it isn't a painful test to bring the patient back for a third hour or a fourth hour gastric emptying assessment. Um, wireless motility capsule could be considered. Um, I, I think we have to keep in mind that while this is very well validated and uh, Professor Rao has been involved in this validation for small bowel and colonic transit, the validation for gastric emptying is perhaps not as, as robust. It's not as accurate because, again, because of the, the work done at Temple University, we know that in about two-thirds of the time, the wireless motility capsule empties from the stomach with the next migrating motor complex. In other words, it doesn't track with the digestible solid meal that's being eaten by the patient. And at the end of the day, we're interested in how the patient's stomach is going to handle food, not how it's going to handle a two centimeter uh, non-digestible solid particle. So in summary, I do think that at the present time, the state of the art is, is the scintigraphic gastric emptying test for four hours. There is some validation of uh, 13 carbon spirulina breath test, and that is also approved by the FDA as, as a p potential alternative for uh, uh, measuring gastric emptying. Interesting though, I think nobody picked either the water load test or the gastric spec scan. So I think perhaps many of them are not aware of them or they felt that this was inappropriate. But I think, uh, stay tuned, I think we will, we, you will learn about these tests. So maybe, maybe Michael, uh, with that introduction, why don't you probably just help us a little bit more, give us some background about these tests and, and tell us
you know, the importance of, uh, of these tests, what we're measuring, what do we see when we measure, how the radiologists report these tests if we are asking nuclear me medicine folks to help us, and then how, do, how should we as clinicians use this information in our practice? Okay, thanks, Satish. I'll, I'll try and, uh, and, do, and follow your requests here. So the first important point is uh, that we need to get the scintigraphic gastric emptying test done over a period of four hours. This is just an example of scans uh, showing at two hours 35% emptied, which is actually within our normal range. And at four hours, there's only 67% emptied. Um, with this particular meal, which has 350 kilocalories and 30% fat, as you can see, this is made with raw eggs, not with um, egg beaters, which is an egg substitute. This has more fat, and we have used this as a means of trying to develop a more of a stress test, if you wish, for stomach emptying. Um, the normal values are shown there for males and females, and I think the important thing is to know whatever it is that at your hospital, at your center, what test exactly is being done and to know at least if the hospital itself has developed the normal values or if, they're, if it's done exactly as it's stated in the literature, what are the normal values that have been reported? So in this case, as I said um, before, gastric emptying is abnormal in, in our test if there's less than 25% emptied at two hours and there's more than 25% uh, retained at four hours. The next thing to think of is perhaps the, one of the breath tests. Uh, clearly from the responses, I think this is, it has not yet had the same level of penetration in our clinical practice. And it's used, I think, predominantly at the present time in clinical trials. And you can see there uh, some of the validation studies that have been done, for instance, looking at simultaneous scintigraphy on the y-axis and breath tests on the x-axis. And you can see that whether you give the, the volunteer erythromycin or no treatment or atropine, the data are very close to the line of identity, the y equals x line, suggesting that you can get to have quite an accurate assessment of gastric emptying using this, uh, this type of breath test. Remember, 13 carbon is a stable isotope, and therefore there's no radiation exposure associated with it. How is this done? There's a standardized meal. It contains 13 carbon alga called spirulina. The patient exhales breath at defined periods of time, and then the, uh, the breath samples are sent to a centralized laboratory, usually, and then the result is sent back to the clinic with the estimates of, of different endpoints. A third thing that we might consider in patients with functional upper GI symptoms, nausea, vomiting, bloating, early satiety, upper abdominal discomfort, those are also the symptoms of patients with functional dyspepsia. And uh, until relatively recently, it has been difficult to measure the relaxation or accommodation response after a meal in, in humans. Um, <clears throat> In the past, people had, have used a, a balloon placed into the stomach. And Satish, you did some studies, I think, in patients with diabetes uh, when you were in Iowa, showing that in diabetic autonomic neuropathy, there's a failure of gastric accommodation. Correct. And we might come back and talk about that later. But a non-invasive approach involves uh, injecting technetium intravenously. That's taken up by the mucin-secreting cells and the parietal cells of the lining of the stomach. And there you can see a transaxial image which shows the mucosa. And then you can, uh, with a SPECT camera, single photon emission computed tomography, you can take slices through the stomach. And then you can use a computer to put all those slices together, put the donuts together, if you wish, to get the volume of the stomach during fasting and after a meal. And by doing that, therefore, you can measure the accommodation response of the stomach. So the, these look like great tests then, Michael. So we, we have some nice way of assessing motor function, particularly. So we, have, we can look at accommodation with this. We can look at gastric emptying, either with the breath test or scintigraphy. And we'll, we'll talk maybe later about wireless motility capsule. But uh, what about the, I mean, stomach has multiple functions. As, as I know you, you, you've talked so many times, you know, it has 
um, satiety function, a sensory function, and a motor function. So is there some other things that we can do to, yeah. to understand that part of the... Great, great question, Satish. And, and of course, what we also have to remember is that if you happen to be at Mayo Clinic, then this test is available to you. But if you're not, um, are there other ways in which you can try to assess postprandial symptoms uh, with a surrogate of, of the accommodation response and also sensation? Because the patients are going to develop the symptoms and this has been a useful way to assess postprandial symptoms. And an alternative to what I'm going to describe here is a water load test, which many people have, have probably heard of. Um, Ken Cook and, and Henry Parkman and others uh, in the uh, NIH Gastroparesis Consortium have also used the water load test to assess this. So how is this test done? So a, a participant, a patient, is given ensure to drink, that's one kilocalorie per milliliter, and they drink at a rate of 30 milliliters per minute. And, and at the same time, we measure the level of satiation or fullness after the meal. And we can measure, number three here refers to the volume to fullness, and number five is the maximum tolerated volume. Volume to fullness is the point at which people are comfortable with what they've eaten. But number five means if they drink any more, ensure they're going to you know, feel the need to vomit. So that's the maximum tolerated volume. And then 30 minutes after the meal, one can also assess postprandial symptoms like nausea, fullness, bloating, and pain. Now, what's really interesting is that a study done by Jan Tuck in Leuven in Belgium had shown in a comparison between accommodation measured by the balloon placed in the stomach, the barostat balloon, and this nutrient drink test, you can see that when it's abnormal, and for us, abnormal is less than 750 kilocalories, you see there's a very nice, pretty nice correlation between what's measured by the barostat and what's measured with the nutrient drink test. And so in some respects, I think that if we're in practice or we don't have this type of imaging available, then one could use the Ensure drink test to assess both the sensitivity or the symptoms and also perhaps to have some inference of what the accommodation of the stomach is doing. So this is how I think this might be a good thing that people can try to consider um, um, assimilating into their practice. So what about, I mean, um, this is an interesting study, right? I think uh, where there's a very large group of patients, um, I mean, they were followed up, and then, uh, and then can, you, can you tell us the story here? So this is, a, this is literally from our clinical practice. Three of us gastroenterologists who see a lot of these patients with upper gastrointestinal symptoms, over a period of 10 years, um, we had done these standardized tests. Gastric emptying, as I said, 320 kilocalorie, 30% fat, and gastric accommodation with that SPECT imaging. And what was really interesting for us was that it's approximately a quarter of patients with these functional upper GI symptoms, and these were diabetics, they were idiopathic, they're, you know, we just characterized the patients who came to us with the symptoms. And a quarter have both abnormal gastric emptying and gastric accommodation. A quarter have normal gastric emptying and gastric accommodation, presumably, um, their symptoms arise from hypersensitivity of the stomach. A quarter had only abnormal gastric emptying, and a quarter had only abnormal gastric accommodation. And certainly, um, the symptoms are often associated with these abnormal functions. And perhaps the best data that we have really are related to um, the degree of gastric emptying, which you can see here, um, the relationship with, with nausea and vomiting um, and paradoxically bloating is more associated with accelerated gastric emptying um, and abdominal discomfort um, is also associated with delayed gastric emptying. So this is how uh, the, the data came out when we analyzed this relatively large group of patients. So this is interesting data and very thought-provoking, right, Michael? So, I mean, the, the general notion that has at least being said that, you know, symptoms are not very predictive, uh, they don't help us uh, for identifying patients or in managing them. But here, I think in this series anyway, in, in a center, of course, uh, 
of excellence that does it very systematically, you're really showing something very important, right? Well, we feel that this actually does suggest that there is a relationship between symptoms and degree of delay of gastric emptying. Um, and, you know, we have actually analyzed the literature, and what we have found is if you do a systematic review meta-analysis, if the gastric emptying is measured in what we would call an optimal manner, which means emptying of solids for at least three hours, observation for at least three hours, then there actually is a significant relationship between the delay in gastric emptying and the, uh, uh, the presence of, uh, of symptoms consistent with, with you know, nausea and vomiting, early satiety, etc. So I think that it's really important when we're analyzing the literature to be careful that we're appraising the symptoms with the right uh, instrument like the gastroparesis cardinal symptom index, for example, and we also assess the gastric emptying in an optimal manner so that we can uh, get a correct interpretation of the relationship between gastric emptying and symptoms. So that's kind of how we think that uh, this analysis, which was published in GUT in the last six months, helps us understand that gastric emptying really is still an important um, way in which we can assess these patients to individualize treatment for them. So I think uh, uh, we invited the audience to engage with us, and I think I see a few questions here that I'd like to just take for a moment before we get to the next part. So the first one of the questions was, what is the cost for each of the tests? So do you want to? So a nutrient drink test is probably the least costly because it can be run by anybody, and a can of Ensure is the cost of a can of Ensure. Um, scintigraphy, the cost of technetium alone is only about $120, and so then it comes down to what is the cost of doing um, five scans. Um, 20, 30 years ago, we used to, most everybody around the country, used to do gastric emptying studies by taking a scan every 15 minutes. But subsequently, it was demonstrated that in actual fact, if you take a scan at baseline one, two, three, and four hours, just five scans, you actually have about 95% of the information as if you were taking a scan every 15 minutes. So the cost of gastric emptying by scintigraphy is the cost of the isotope and then whatever it is that your nuclear medicine department tells you is required to, uh, to, to support the cost of taking five scans. Um, the SPECT imaging is a 30-minute test. Again, the technetium costs about $250 because you have to use more um, intravenous technetium there. But again, uh, off the top of my head, I don't know what the charges are at Mayo Clinic. I, I don't know what the costs are either. But I'm, I'm trying to say that the simplest thing, of course, would be to estimate the symptoms on the cardinal symptom index and do an ensure drink test, um, and then also consider a scintigraphic gastric emptying test. So I think, yeah, at the, roughly the cost at our center anyway for gastric scintigraphy is about $750. Uh, uh, and I think there's probably another $250 on top of it, but that's about the range. Somewhere between $750 to $1,000 is the cost of gastric scintigraphy. And there's one other quick uh, uh, question I'd like to take uh, from an audience is, is GCSI DD diagnostic of gastroparesis? And good question. It's a great question, and um, you know, it's possible that Henry, who's in the audience, can, can chime in here. I wouldn't say it's diagnostic because the symptoms themselves are not specific for gastroparesis. So the same symptoms actually occur in a number of other conditions, including, of course, functional dyspepsia. So I wouldn't say that they are diagnostic, but they're a good way of assessing the patient's symptom severity and a baseline from which you can then assess response to therapy. Thank you. Sorry. So uh, with that, that finishes the very first part of our uh, uh, discussion. So we'll now move on to learning objective number two. Okay, so thinking about the pathophysiology of gastroparesis, we all know, of course, that there is an important vagal innervation of the stomach uh, 
and that the vagus then interacts with the neuromuscular apparatus within the wall of the stomach. So the enteric nervous system consisting of neurons in the, in the wall of the stomach and the activation of pacemaker cells like the interstitial cells of Cajal or these fibroblast-like cells which are positive for platelet-derived growth factor receptor alpha. And those are both um, excitatory types of, uh, of apparatus that stimulates the smooth muscle cells. Now, when the vagus nerve sends a message to the stomach, if it interacts with nitric oxide nerve in the fundus, it results in accommodation. And if it interacts, when it interacts with uh, cholinergic nerves in the, let's say, in the antrum of the stomach, it causes contractility. So you have this dual effect of the vagus, which is to induce accommodation, but also to induce contractions of the stomach to get the stomach to empty food. And of course, that involves the activation of the enteric nervous system, the interstitial cells of Cajal, and the smooth muscle cells. So gastroparesis can occur because of a disturbance in any of these four or five um, um, players in the, in the function of the stomach. And one, one of the things that's really exciting is information that suggests that an in inflammatory response within the wall of the intestine which may be caused, for instance, by diabetes, um, may be impacting the survival of those uh, pacemaker cells in the wall of the stomach. And this may be a future direction for um, conditions like diabetic gastroparesis. It's also been described to a lesser extent in idiopathic gastroparesis. But that is really something, I think, for the distant future. It's not an immediate thing um, that we can restore um, the uh, the cells of the enteric nervous system or the muscles by an anti-inflammatory approach. Okay, so another interesting mechanism that I think we would like to briefly uh, talk about is the role of ghrelin. So now can I have the video please? So this is an animation that I'd like to walk, walk you through. And, and first of all, we'll talk about the normal anatomy uh, and then we will contrast that with what could happen in a patient with uh, gastroparesis and so on. So you can see in this uh, cartoon here, we have the hypothalamus, we have the vagal, vagus nerve, we have the stomach, and once you eat a meal, there is uh, fundic relaxation, active gastric contraction, and, and, and then there is release of ghrelin. Ghrelin is released both locally and through the bloodstream. It, it goes up to the hypothalamus and then activates the hypothalamus and there the vagal signals come down to activate the stomach. In addition, ghrelin is, also has local effects within the uh, enteroendocrine cells. It has local effects on the interstitial cells of Cajal as well as it is being released uh, into the mucosa. But what then happens really is some of the ghrelin that then goes to the brain, here is, is ghrelin, uh, and, and this will also latch itself on to the growth hormone secretagogue, GHS receptor, activates release of growth hormone. So these are some of the common normal mechanisms that take place with the release of ghrelin, and, and ghrelin has an important integral role in, uh, in gastric uh, emptying regulation in normal humans. Now, let's see what happens uh, through an, another animation in patients with uh, diabetic gastroparesis. So let's roll the tape again. So here you can see in diabetic gastroparesis, the, we don't fully understand whether there is decreased ghrelin yet, but what we do know is there is significant neuropathy. So consequently, the signaling that is coming down, even we accept that uh, adequate ghrelin is going up to the hypothalamus and so on, the signaling coming down is significantly impaired, leading to impaired gastric motility, impaired accommodation, and impaired gastric contractility, as illustrated by this. So deficiency, uh, or, or, or in a, because of underlying neuropathy, the ability of the stomach to work adequately uh, is, is significantly compromised. And so that, I think, is, is an important mechanism that is potentially available for us to try and see, can we use this, can we correct this mechanism of, of ghrelin uh, uh, pathway 
to improve gastric function because ghrelin can act directly uh, either through or uh, through the vagal nerve or directly onto the muscle and activate the stomach leading to uh, gas improved gastric emptying and improved gastric function and whether we can use this mechanism to actually help our patients with gastroparesis. So just I think this we thought it would be in, nice to introduce this uh, ghrelin concept here but we'll come back to talk about our case. So let me go on with our case. So here, uh, uh, what did we do uh, in, in my practice? So in this particular patient, we actually did uh, a wireless motility capsule test. And, and you've heard uh, the other test descriptions by Dr. Camilleri. So uh, just for those of you who are not familiar with this particular test, uh, it has the time axis is on the horizontal arm. The uh, vertical arm has both uh, pH, which is shown in the green. The red is the pressure activity curve. And you can see in this normal healthy individual, initially after the ingestion of this bar and the smart pill capsule, the pH is high, around three to four. Gradually, it comes down. And then abruptly, somewhere about uh, just under three hours, there is a significant abrupt increase in pH. And that is because the wireless motility capsule has now left the stomach and has entered the more alkaline duodenal pH. And then it moves on. So we use this as a measure of gastric residence time or as a measure of gastric emptying time. And in this particular healthy normal individual, it was 3.1 hours. What you can also see is prior to the, prior to the emptying of the pill, there are very large giant antral contractions, uh, you can see them here, that facilitates emptying along the lines that Michael mentioned that the pill usually moves on uh, alongside an MMC, onset of an MMC. So now I'm going to contrast this with the patient, uh, with our teacher here, and here is her gastric emptying profile. And as you can see, first of all, she had a very low pH, I mean, a little buffering in the bill, and then it stays low and uh, around six and a half hours the pill actually empties. There are some antral contractions prior to that, and then it empties. So this lady had significantly delayed gastric emptying of over six hours. So a, a word about this wireless motility capsule. Uh, most, this is some, some very recent work that uh, we've all been involved in a head-to-head -head, uh, comparison study uh, in clinical practice. There were about eight centers that were involved in the study. 250 patients were enrolled in this comparison study of uh, the patients underwent both studies simultaneously. And what you can see here is uh, with regards to the number of subjects with delayed gastric emptying, there were more subjects picked up with the wireless motility capsule than the scintigraphy uh, with, uh, with a significant P difference, about delta of about 11 uh, in this uh, percent in this overall group of 250 patients. What was important, though, is in addition to identifying delayed gastric emptying, which is a, a true advantage of this test, is you can also assess um, the transit in other components of the gut. For example, here we saw in the study that 23% of these patients had delayed small bowel transit, and about 32% had delayed colonic transit time. This was additional information. This is very similar to what um, uh, Dr. Camilleri does in his practice where he does a whole gut scintigraphy, and I think even Henry does in their practice, where they not only assess gastric emptying time, but they assess the whole gut transit time. So they get them additional information that they can use then to managing their patients. So the next question that was asked in this study, and this was the last part of this wireless motility capsule I want to share with you, is uh, did the wireless motility capsule testing in this cohort of patients eliminate the need for additional testing, and that was significantly true. Uh, you can see that in 71% of patients, there was no need for additional testing. So I think there was significant difference between wireless motility capsule and gastric emptying scintigraphy, showing that this has a place in the assessment of patients. It can be done in your practice. Uh, you, pro you get uh, a whole gut profile information, and it would decrease the need for additional testing. So that is, the, that is what we found in our patient. And then let's move on to our final objective, is to really use all of this information to translate this into managing this patient. So our objective here is to evaluate the clinical efficacy and safety profiles of current and emerging agents for the management of diabetic gastroparesis.
So I'm going to have Michael again help us because he's done some great work, very recently published this work. So Michael, can you tell us about this? Thank you. Thank you, Satish. So one of the things we did, an extension of what I mentioned before, we had previously shown that an optimal gastric emptying test gives you an association between delayed gastric emptying and symptoms. And then what we did was we reviewed the literature and to see if you have an improvement of gastric emptying measured in an optimal manner, is that associated with an improvement in the symptoms of the patients? And as you can see using this meta-regression analysis, there is a significant correlation between the improvement in gastric emptying T half and the improvement in the upper GI symptoms. And I wouldn't worry about the details, but we were also able to identify what level of improvement in gastric emptying is really associated with an improvement in symptoms. And approximately a 20 to 30 minute improvement in gastric emptying can be predicted to be associated with an improvement in symptoms. And so this, I think, tells us that it still is important to assess the gastric emptying. And if we find it's abnormal, uh, if it's delayed, in other words, then I think we need to be considering what might be the types of treatments that might be able to help such a patient. So let me ask you a question here. This is related to ghrelin, uh, Michael. I think you probably are the best to answer this because um, your other area of research has been uh, obesity and, and so on. The, the, the member of the audience asks, is there any role for ghrelin in bariatric patients who are diabetic and had gastroparesis prior to surgery? So uh, ghrelin, in some respects, in the context of obesity, um, actually increases appetite. So yes, we're going to, uh, we've got some evidence that, a, a, as uh, Satish mentioned, ghrelin has an ability to activate the pathways to stimulate gastric emptying. But it also, in, especially in the fasting period, um, has an effect on appetite. So in the context of the patient with obesity, you know, one has to uh, think about this very carefully. What are the pros and cons? Um, I've not seen any information but specifically on the, on the bariatric surgery patients. So. And likewise, uh, do you know of any data of ghrelin in post-gastrectomy patients? Uh, um, the, uh, there was a paper in the New England Journal that suggested that uh, in post-gastrectomy patients, the ghrelin level drops. But surprise, surprise, you cut out 90% of the cells in the body that are producing ghrelin, and the level of ghrelin drops. So it was a little bit predictable. Um, so I don't know whether that uh, really helps us decide what might be the role of, of ghrelin in the post-bariatric surgery patient. All right, so let's engage the audience one more time, Michael. So let's uh, pose this question to them and say, now, friends, you've, you've heard the story, you've heard the investigation in this patient, we know what she has. So what would be your approach for the management of this patient with gastroparesis? Would you give this lady metoclopramide? Would you give erythromycin? Would you give domperidone? Would you give procalopride? Would you uh, uh, subject her to gastric uh, electrical stimulation or pacemaker? Or would you give anti-nausea treatment, uh, procolperazine, CBD oil is now becoming very popular, also available in Georgia, <laughs> uh, or you're not sure? So let me... Aha, that is interesting, Michael. That's a really interesting uh, um, response. You... Right, <laughs> let's walk, walk, walk us through. Let's what... walk through, okay. Well, the patient has previously tried metoclopramide um, and perhaps Another trial, maybe using it as a liquid formula, for example, 15 or 30 minutes before meals, that certainly is a, a, po a possibility. And I think also having the result of the wireless motility capsule kind of helps us reinforce with the patient the importance of using a prokinetic, and metoclopramide ultimately is the only prokinetic that's approved uh, in, in the United States. So, so can, I, can I ask, yeah. I mean, do you actually, um, I mean, you know, there's a lot of concern about litigation and the side effects. So what do you do in your practice? How, how do yeah. you? So first of all, I, I'd like to restrict the dose of metoclopramide to a maximum of 40 milligrams per day. So I typically start five milligrams liquid formula 15 to 30 minutes before meals and before bedtime. And if that's not enough, the most I will go up to is 10 milligrams four times a day. Now, 
the, why don't I give a higher dose? Well, that's when you start to get the anxiety, the depression, maybe sometimes hyper, you know, a, an increase in prolactin, some, ga, you know, some, some uh, breast tenderness. But also there's the fear of involuntary movements. And yes, there can be involuntary movements, but thankfully, the vast majority of patients who get involuntary movement with metoclopramide, they're completely reversible. The concern and the black box warning uh, when you prescribe metoclopramide is regarding tardive dyskinesia, which is an irreversible involuntary movement. Now, the estimates, and this has been confirmed recently by a publication in 2019 by Per Helmstrom's group in, in, uh, in Scandinavia, they've shown that the prevalence of true irreversible tardive dyskinesia based on Scandinavian, UK, German UK, um, prescription databases, the prevalence is probably closer to one in 10,000 than the 4% that was estimated from a VA study in the United States. So the VA study, unfortunately, was, was what alarmed the FDA and resulted in the black box warning. But if you actually look at the papers on that VA study, there were no, there's no information about controls, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't know uh, why those 4% actually had the tardive dyskinesia, but I think it's important not to extrapolate from that information that um, you know, every time we're gonna give metoclopramide as a prescription, that we're going to put the patient at the risk of irreversible tardive dyskinesia. The other thing that we do, the precaution, is that we tell the patient, if you get any involuntary movements, or you're feeling down, depressed, etc., stop the drug and then call me. Not the other way around. Not call me and I'll tell you what to do. Stop the drug first, okay? The third thing I do is I routinely ex um, include in my medical record exactly the sort of information that I've given to the patient, the education, the instructions, et cetera, et cetera. So those are the three precautions. Just to summarize, liquid formula low dose, um, inform the patient if they have side effects to stop the drug and then call you, and document it in the medical record exactly what you've done. So we've done the first one. So metoclopramide is still a, a possibility here. Erythromycin, um, for patients who have acute retention, they're in hospital, it's our drug of choice. Three milligrams per kilogram intravenously, if you can get it because it's becoming scarcer, but that's the way in which you get bezoars out of the stomach, that's the way in which you kind of jumpstart the stomach if the patient is admitted to hospital with acute gastroparesis. Domperidone certainly would be an alternative. Its predominant benefit is, I think, in the treatment of nausea and vomiting has some prokinetic action, which is probably equivalent to the prokinetic action of metoclopramide. Um, of course, there are regulatory things that you have to suffice, uh, informing the IRB and, and, uh, and paperwork to fill in for the FDA. Prucalopride is an interesting one, because now it's approved for the treatment of constipation, and very often we see patients with constipation, as Dr. Dr. Rao showed us, this patient has slow colonic transit. I think that would be a very reasonable approach to, uh, to consider prucalopride in this patient. As you know, unlike the previous 5-HT4 agonists, it is devoid of the same effects on cardiac dysrhythmia, that were considered you know, uh, a risk factor with medications like cisapride. So I, I agree with, uh, with all of, essentially all those choices seem very reasonable to me. Gastric electrical stimulation, I think in this day and age, you know, um, is probably going to be used less and less, but we'll, we'll see. Anti-nausea treatment may be required in addition to the prokinetic medication. So I very often will use both a prokinetic and an anti-emetic, anti-nausea medication. CBD oil is interesting. Um, CBD oil is a cannabinoid type two receptor agonist. Cannabinoid type two receptors are predominantly peripheral. They're not in the center. So there should be less psychogenic effect from CBD oil compared to, for example, um, THC or marijuana. So that's a possibility, but let's keep in mind there are essentially no studies of CB2, 
uh, cannabinoid type 2 receptor agonists like CBD oil. So, um, you know, patients may tell us their appetite improves, their nausea got better, and that could be beneficial to them. Um, not sure is also a reasonable co a response. Um, and, uh, you know, we'd see if there are any other comments. So I think th this is good. Uh, I think that was a very good discussion, Michael. You really walked us through all of these options. So let's assume that someone has tried all of them and the patient is still not better. So are there any other new options that we can be thinking about that you can tell us? Sure. Thanks, Satish. So one of the options that's in development, it's currently in phase three program, um, is summarized here from the phase 2b study. So this is relamorelin, which is a pentapeptide. It's a small molecule, ghrelin receptor agonist. And just to remind ourselves, as, as Satish mentioned earlier, you know, the ghrelin receptors are found on the no-dose ganglion in the afferent vagal pathways. And so when ghrelin is released, um, it activates that. Now, the the relamorelin as a ghrelin receptor agonist activates that sensory neuron and it also stimulates the hypothalamic vagal nucleus pathway and it has a direct effect also on the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus because there are ghrelin receptors there. And there's also now some evidence that both in the colon and in the stomach, the myenteric neurons in the wall of the stomach have ghrelin receptors. So in some respects, relamorelin would be expected to activate the whole reflex arc as well as stimulate the, uh, the end organ, if you wish, the myenteric neurons in the wall of the stomach. And so here are data from a gastric emptying profile that was uh, improved with ghrelin in the previous studies. And this was associated also with an improvement in the symptoms, the composite symptom scores that were used to assess the uh, efficacy of relamorelin in the treatment of gastroparesis. And as I said, this is now going through the phase three studies, the trials. Um, the, the, the medication is not yet approved for, uh, for use in the United States. Um, an alternative, of course, would be procalopride. You heard it's just been approved for the treatment of constipation. These are data from uh, Leuven in Belgium and Actually, Jan Tak and Florencia Carbone told me uh, uh, yesterday that this uh, pilot study, which was an abstract, is now accepted for publication, and we can read the whole paper in the American Journal of, of Gastroenterology. So, procalopride is associated with an, um, an acceleration of gastric emptying, um, and uh, so procalopride is, is the yellow color here relative to baseline and relative to placebo, there's a marked acceleration. And interestingly, remember I told you the number before, a 20 to 30 uh, minute difference in gastric emptying would be predicted to be associated with an improvement in symptoms. And that is actually what they also showed. So for virtually many of these uh, symptoms, fullness, early satiety, nausea, vomiting, etc., etc., there was an improvement of the symptoms with procalopride in idiopathic gastroparesis. Now, let's keep in mind, these were 28 patients, and there are no large trials yet with procalopride in gastroparesis, at least that I know of. But Satish, what else can we, can we think of doing? Um, have you, I've been reading about all of these new devices and these new procedures. You know, I like devices and procedures. So, <laughs> well, 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 well I'll, I'll, let me give you some thought. But before that, let me ask you this question. Uh, is your approach to a patient with gastroparesis different when the dominant symptom is abdominal pain? No, we, we listed those things. So yeah. would you do something different? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, Charlene Prather may remember when I told her this when, when she, was a, she was a fellow. I said to Charlene when we were doing rounds in the hospital, if the patient's predominant symptom is pain, think again. To my mind, gastroparesis implies stasis, it, and I usually associate it more with nausea, vomiting, early satiety. Now, having said that, you know, the, the gastroparesis consortium is a much larger database than my anecdotal rounding with Charlene on the hospital service at Mayo Clinic. And so, you know, there is evidence that some of the patients also have significant abdominal pain. 
Those tend to also be the patients who are on central neuromodulators or unfortunately also on opiates. And of course that makes it very difficult because the opioid or opiate may make it more likely that the patient has delayed gastric emptying and it's I think sometimes very difficult to tease out is the pain the predominant problem the patient is then on the opioids and develops the delayed gastric emptying and the nausea and vomiting. So uh, yes, the short answer to your question is, if the patient has predominant pain, I often need to assess the patient further, um, perhaps do that nutrient drink test, see what the scores are of pain relative to nausea and vomiting, for example, and perhaps think more about um, trying to deal with the pain component of their symptomatology without resorting to opioids. I think that it is a very, it really brings up a very important point. I mean, there are multiple aspects of these patients that we need to consider. Although we've focused a little bit on the, um, on some of the prokinetics and anti-nausea, but you know, they have nutrition issues that have to be taken care of. They have diabetic issues that has to be taken care of. There is a pain component that some of them may have. So I think you really need a good team of people that will help you. So together, I think you can really provide a good holistic approach to them. So I think one of the things you asked, Michael, is, is there something else that we can do? So I think I want to really go back to my usual basics of, of motility, which I enjoy so much. So the lower panel here uh, really is a slide showing anteroduodenal, anteropyloric duodenal motility. And as you can see, it is nicely coordinated. There are nice antro contractions that migrate into the duodenum and then onto the jejunum in an orderly manner. But if you look at the top one, this is a sensor that is in the pyloric region. And look what's going on there. So there is some activity going on, but this is continuously in spasm. These are sometimes, I mean, also described by my mentor, Nick Reed, as isolated pyloric pressure waves, or the IPPWs. So this is a very intense, persistent pyloric, almost spasm, um, as, as this uh, slide shows from Dr. Camilleri. So really showing that, you know, this is going to obstruct, functionally obstruct the flow of materials from the stomach. So this could be happening in some of our patients with gastroparesis. So if so, one of the treatments that is now being, uh, being tried out in many centers, uh, we heard one presentation today from Cleveland Clinic, and I'm sure there are others, is the G-POEM, where uh, per endoscopically, they're really doing a myotomy of the pyloric sphincter. And so what is the evidence? How good is the evidence? Well, let's look at some a, a, a very recently published meta-analysis here. You can see, first of all, what I want to point out is there are very small number of patients here. In fact, there is one other study that is not quoted. The largest number was 47, but by and large, you know, there are very small number of studies. The total, I think, is about 230 or 40 in the study. And, and if you look at the weighted pool rate for success, yes, it appears that you know, uh, the, the G-POEM is useful uh, in, in, in improving gastroparitic symptoms. Uh, uh, and they also measured both GCSI, and they also looked at gastric retention of four hours, and, and there is clear improvement in, in gastric emptying as well. So, but these are, what I would like to say, are uncontrolled, open-label studies, uh, and, and I think more feasibility kind of studies where they're really trying to see whether can it be done, does it help, does it unfortunately hurt these patients. It appears to be safe, technically, people have learned this technology very well and they're doing it, but now is the time that we need to apply scientific rigor and evidence to this technology. Is it really useful? Is it as promising as these initial studies claim? I think we need, uh, wouldn't you agree that we really need a lot more data on yes. this? Absolutely, and in fact, in a session this morning, um, I think it was Dr. Rodriguez who, who actually mentioned that they've done this procedure so effectively at Cleveland Clinic that they now do it as an outpatient procedure. Um, they have done something like 443 patients up to now, um, but they're also now thinking of doing a sham controlled study. He said that in answering one of the questions. Um, you know, just like uh, we know that 
from other experiences, we, we do need ultimately to have that scientific rigor to be absolutely sure uh, what, what is the, the value that, is, that such a new procedure would bring to the care of patients. Uh, up to now, the really encouraging thing is that it appears that it can be done safely. And as I said, um, high volume um, procedure places like, like Cleveland Clinic are now, have now perfected this to the point where it's even being done only as an outpatient procedure. So I think uh, uh, before we come to a final slide here, Michael, I think there's a question on Velucitrac and, and you know, can you tell us more? So we heard a nice presentation at our, at our plenary session at the NGM about Velucitrac. Uh, it's uh, another serotonin agonist. And I think Brad Coe actually presented on behalf of the group. And, and so what was your take home from yeah, that study? Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting. Um, Velucitrag is, just for everybody to, to know, is another 5-HD4 receptor agonist, which is very safe from a cardiac standpoint. And it appears to be quite promising. A study of more than 200 patients was presented this afternoon. Improvement of gastric emptying on scintigraphy and also uh, in a 12-week study, keeping in mind it's a phase 2B study, there was particularly um, significant benefit in the first four weeks. The, as often happens, of course, placebo has also a good response rate, and so the differentiation from placebo beyond four weeks was not evident. But let's keep in mind that that was a phase 2B study. It wasn't powered, really, to, to show uh, benefit throughout the 12-week study. So I think it's promising. I think uh, from everything that's been presented, it appears to be safe. And it appears also to have a beneficial effect on stomach emptying. And I think it was also done, I mean, it was tested in chronic constipation, right? In IBS and C and chronic um, constipation? I, it's been tested, but in the context of, of a pharmacodynamic study. I do not believe that there's been any clinical trial. Just let me come back, because that's just reminded me. We actually did a single center study of Rela Morelin on uh, colonic motility and colonic transit. And Rela Morelin, the ghrelin receptor agonist, also stimulates colonic transit and colonic high amplitude propagated contractions. So just like there are ghrelin receptors in the stomach, my enteric plexus, which I'm stimulated with the uh, ghrelin receptor agonist, Grela Morelin, also the colon may be uh, stimulated by the same mechanism through the same ghrelin receptors on the myenteric neurons of the colon. Oh, that's nice to know. I didn't know about the colon part. That's really good. Well, let's look at some uh, smart goals that we have, uh, we have achieved today. So what we try to review for you are the overlapping symptoms of diabetic gastroparesis. Uh, and it is a pan-gut dysfunction. I'd like to emphasize that. Diabetic gastroparesis, although we tend to focus on the stomach, please remember in a significant proportion of patients, I, I, I believe it's a pan-gut dysfunction, and we see that when we run these tests of pan-gut dysmotility. What we've also tried to cover for you today is the role of ghrelin, and it has an important role in, in regulation of gastric motility. It is normally, it, this goes on all the time, and I think what we've, as we try to understand more about this ghrelin, and we have some drugs, uh, that can help us in, in improving the management of patients uh, with, with diabetic gastroparesis. And then we have several new treatments for diabetic gastroparesis that can improve our outcomes for patients that are on the, on the horizon that we just discussed, some of them, uh, procalopride, velucitrac, as well as uh, uh, relimorelin and, and others. And I'm sure there are some more selective domperidones and selective metoclopramides, et cetera, may, may also come in the way. What you're seeing right now on the screen are some resources that are potentially available to you and for your patients. So you can actually uh, go to this website and, and use this. I mean, these are some common questions our patients ask us. You know, what is, what is gastroparesis? What is diabetic gastroparesis? What are the symptoms? Uh, and, and so on. So these are some simple tools that, that you can actually download in your practice and you can use this as an important patient resource. For, for, for managing this patient. So as this uh, goes on, we have about 10 minutes or so in our time. And so Michael, I'd like to engage you and, and we can try and see uh, what the audience questions are. They are, they are coming um, from all directions here. So one of the questions is, um, 
What proportion of patients do you think have post-infective gastroparesis? And do you do any different for managing those patients? Yeah, um, I suspect that this is overemphasized. Um, so I, you know, there are a couple of papers in the literature, post-viral. Um, Jan Tak had a, a, a series of patients that seemed to be post-infectious functional dyspepsia. Um, to prove that it's actually an infection is extremely rare. Unless the patient has had, let's say, herpes zoster that affected T5 to T10 dermatome on the abdomen. Those, I think, I would believe. But whether post-infectious gastroparesis from a simple viral gastroenteritis occurs, I haven't been completely convinced about. And in all honesty, I don't think there's anything specific that you can do other than treat the patient's symptoms and give the best medications, prokinetic and anti-emetic. Anti I like this question, Michael. The, the member asks, how accurate are motility studies in diabetics who are already on dozens of medications, including psychotropic ones? So this is a very good question. So if, if we're talking about diabetics, there are two or three things to keep in mind. Psychotropic medications, certainly. Remember, they may also be on a medication for peripheral neuropathy, which may delay um, stomach emptying. Um, and the third thing to remember, especially in type 2 diabetics, is when the patient is on a GLP-1 receptor agonist. So exenatide, liraglutide, semaglutide, all the tides, okay, they work, they are like GLP-1 receptor agonists. They improve blood glucose by delaying stomach emptying. So guess what? The patient then is sent to me from the diabetic clinic with, with impaired gastric emptying or nausea and vomiting. So the trick there, and you'll really score well with your diabetology colleagues, you mustn't change the treatment yourself because they'll be very upset with you. But what you can do is you can recommend a change from a GLP-1 receptor agonist, exenatide, uh, liraglutide, etc., to a DPP-4 inhibitor, a dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitor, like citagliptin or vildagliptin. Those are two examples. So the gliptins do not have a big effect on, uh, like, uh, on the GLP-1 level, okay? So they produce an enhancement of your endogenous GLP-1, but it's not like giving an extraneous GLP-1 agonist or, or analog, and therefore it does not have the, if, the negative effect on gastric emptying. And we, and Michael Horowitz in Australia, has shown that if you use a DPP-4 inhibitor, you do not impair gastric emptying. So, just to remind you, if there's a pain medication, it could be delaying gastric emptying. If the patient is on a psychotropic medication, and diabetic, they, that could delay gastric emptying, especially the tricyclic agents. In that case, I usually ask the psychiatrist or the other person to consider using an SSRI instead of a tricyclic agent. And then finally, remember the, the GLP-1 ag agonists or analogs and replace those with a DPP-4 inhibitor. So there's a question here, and I'm going to take a little stab at that, and then maybe we can even get a couple of people from the audience to join in. So if medications do not work, then would you try pil a Botox injection of the pylorus first before you think of POEM? I think it's a great question. So I think uh, Botox has been used. Initially, studies were quite uh, promising. Uh, I know Henry is, I'm going to have Henry comment on this in a minute. And, and then it, there were two fairly well done randomized controlled trials. Uh, one was very negative from, from Europe. Henry's group study was a little uh, on the edge about the role of Botox. And, and, but I think from a gastroenterologist perspective, this is something easy, and many of you have access to it, and, and you feel like you know, maybe we should do it. So I don't know. I don't routinely use Botox in my practice in, in gastroparitic patients because the evidence has been very slim, and so I've not done, I've not used it. So, it's not my go-to drug, but I'm going to have maybe... Henry, do you want to comment? And then I'll have Michael comment. Can you tell us? Um, in some patients, Botox in the pylorus seems to help. We don't really have a good idea of what patients might respond to Botox. There's a recent article that suggests what's called the endoflip, the measure of pyloric pressure and compliance, uh, might 
uh, pick out patients that respond to Botox as well as the G palm. So these are two ways to try to pick out who might respond. In our practice, clinically, we've had trouble the last year getting Botox approved by the insurance company. So that's stymied uh, us. And we, uh, uh, so we're kind of using a lot less of that now only because the insurance won't cover it. For 200 units injected in the pylorus, it's about $1,000. Oh, more than that. It's 800 for 100 units, so it's 1,600, I think. Satish, if you inject Botox into the pylorus, do you think it might impact the potential benefit that could come from a G-POEM procedure? Well, you know, I think this was the question that was even posed, I think, uh, at this morning's symposium to our surgeon. And, and his uh, observation was that uh, there, is very, there is some scarring from Botox, but he doesn't think that impairs the G-POEM procedure, and they're able to do this. Remember, a very similar story was brought up um, way back in the early days um, of, of even the regular Echelasia poem, they, were, they would say, oh, don't give Botox because if we have to do a Heller myotomy, it would be a little problematic, uh, or, or likewise, if we do a poem, it would be problematic. But now I think it doesn't seem to be a big issue. The surgeons have become very comfortable in doing it. So I don't think that would be a big issue. But what I'm concerned, and I think, um, is uh, a lot of folks out in the community are giving a lot of Botox. And potentially, that itself may create a functional obstruction in this area by scarring. And so we need to be a little aware of this happening because after you keep on injecting after a while, you're gonna build up antibodies and it may not be that effective. So that may be something to be, to be, to be borne in mind. But I wanted to ask uh, this, this one other question about, um, is there any uh, relevance for, for um, what is the dose of ghrelin model in these studies? What are the side effects? And any value in measuring ghrelin levels routinely? So I'll answer the last one first. I, I have not seen evidence that measuring the, the plasma of the serum ghrelin level um, helps you decide you know, whether to give relamorelin or not. So I don't know the answer to that question. The, the, one ad, the dose of uh, relamorelin that's being tested is a 30 microgram dose, which was the middle dose in that dose response curve that we showed you um, from the phase 2b studies. The, the one thing to keep in mind is that if you give an effective prokinetic, especially to patients with diabetes, with diabetic gastroparesis, what's gonna happen is the food is going to empty from the stomach and the patient is going to have a higher blood glucose in the postprandial period. But that's sort of a side effect that comes from the, uh, the fact that they're emptying food uh, and therefore gl glucose is getting into the portal circulation, getting into the systemic circulation. Now in that phase 2b study, there wasn't as much appreciation of the fact that there could be postprandial hyperglycemia. And there were about, I think, 8 to 10% of patients, diabetics, who did have postprandial hyperglycemia. So one of the precautions in the phase 3 study is a much more, much closer assessment and management of the postprandial glycemic response. I think it's a question of, you know, getting a better timing of either the insulin or the other anti-diabetic medication to keep the blood glucose under the control because I think it's, it's beneficial to the patient to, to have a much more predictable emptying from the stomach and then being able to know how much insulin to give and not have this imbalance between uh, insulin and emptying from the stomach which could result in the patient developing hypoglycemia. So overall, I think it's positive, but we need to manage it better. We need to work also with our diabetology colleagues to ascertain how best to, to manage the glycemia uh, when we have such an effective prokinetic agent. So one of the things, Michael, that we didn't touch uh, in the course of our discussion is about dietary management in patients with gastroparesis. And it's a very important question. I think one of the members of the audience is asking about uh, you know, diet. And what I tend to do usually, and I think it, it depends on you know, at what stage you're seeing them, are you seeing them outpatients or inpatients, but generally, if they have significant impairment and really even bezoar and things like that, of course, if there's a bezoar, you need to dissolve that. I usually use cellulase uh, 
uh, for three days on empty stomach and, and have them not eat anything for four hours, that helps to dissolve the bezoar. If you can't mechanically you know, uh, break it down during endoscopy and so on. But in terms of dietary management, really, uh, you know, small meals six times a day. I really go for very, very soft meals, yogurt consistency, banana consistency in the beginning. And once after, and I have them do this for between three to four weeks, and then it, gradually introduce one solid meal per week. So over three weeks, they will tip, typically go to three solid meals. So over a period of seven to eight weeks, that is two months, before they essentially go back to their usual diet. So really very slowly, gradually building up their, their diet, starting from soft to a regular meal. One of the challenges, of course, is if you have a diabetic, then it really messes their whole diabetic control. So you've got to work very carefully with, with the endocrinologist and the nutritionist. I usually have my nutritionist help them. So how would you? So to uh, completely agree, two additional points. So there's a study from Gothenburg in Sweden that looked at the size of the particles in the meal and showed that a small particle diet actually is associated with improved symptoms and better tolerance of food in patients with gastroparesis. So, you know, I tell patients, invest in a blender and, and bring the consistency uh, down to, as you said, um, homogenized food or yogurt type consistency. So that's the first point. And there is actually a randomized controlled trial looking at the particle size in the meal. The second is, is the advice that I learned from Henry Parkman's experience in a paper where he, they've actually listed the types of uh, foods and we actually give the patient, there's a paragraph which has all of the information, saltine crackers, cream crackers, and a few other things like that that dissolve easily in the mouth and at least the patient is taking some solids to supplement what they're taking in a liquid or homogenized uh, state. So there's a, there's a couple of questions on this autoimmune uh, gastroparesis. I mean, uh, how would you describe this? And also, you know, is there a subtype that has autoimmune etiology? And if so, how do we evaluate? And does it have a different... Uh, so there is a, you know, one or two reports of this autoimmune um, variant of gastroparesis that's associated with the types of antibodies that are directed against acetylcholine, uh, receptors or neurons and uh, calcium channels and a few things like that. So where did this all start? It actually started in patients who had paraneoplastic gastroparesis or pseudo-obstruction or constipation. So that people had a, a small cell lung cancer, the body produces an antibody which happens to cross-react with these elements, calcium, uh, calcium, receptor, calcium channels, receptors, etc. And, and there have been a few patients reported in the literature that also, without the presence of a, a lung cancer or ovarian cancer, have had these same types of antibodies present in their peripheral blood. So the possibility is indeed that there is a variant of an autoimmune type of gastroparesis. It's, as far as I can understand, um, relatively rare. Um, and some colleagues have been treating these patients with either high-dose steroids or intravenous immunoglobulin. But others in the audience may have more experience than I have. Thank you very much. You've been a great audience to interact with. Really appreciate your time and your questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Great job.